all efforts, commitments and sacrifices to try to keep our citizens uh, safe and healthy during the challenges that we faced. I'd also like to apologise, though, uh, for all of the communities we serve. The system has been under enormous challenge and we are very uh, cognizant of the fact that you have not been receiving the uh, standards of service and turnaround uh, that we historically pride ourselves on. And uh, things are getting better, uh, but I think it's important just to recognise that things have not been as we would want them to be over the last couple of months. So thank you for your forbearance. Um, we are saying goodbye to some uh, friends today. Uh, David Elgenham, our Managing Director, George Elliott, um, is going to pass to us new um, with our, our best wishes and affection. Uh, David, you have been an outstanding steward for the George Elliott since you joined it in 2018. Um, on behalf of Glenn, I, your colleagues and the citizens of North Warwickshire, uh, thank you very much and we wish you well. Uh, we're delighted that Catherine Free, our medical director, is um, uh, taking over as interim managing director. And Catherine, we wish you well. And I'm delighted that today we've got Nadge with us, um, who is um, taking up the role of clinical medical officer um, at the George Elliott. So Nadge, welcome to your first meeting with us. We have some apologies uh, today. Um, we have apologies from Charles Ashton. So Bascar, great to see you again. Thank you. We have apologies from Sophie Gilks. Um, and so uh, Jenny, it's lovely to see you deputising. We have apologies um, from Robin Sneed, our Chief Operating Officer, George Elliott, uh, Phil uh, Thomas Hands, thank you for deputising. And we have apologies from Simone Jordan, Rosie Neefsey and Julie Holder, um, our non-execs at the George Elliott. So, um, as you can imagine, it's somewhat of a challenge to uh, chair a meeting with almost 60 people in it. Uh, so if I can ask you to use the chat box as far as possible for questions um, and perspectives. Um, but first of all, please raise a digital hand if you have any declarations of interest. OK, I can't see any digital hands raised. So we move on to the minutes of the meeting held on the 2nd of November. Now, I need to just do this uh, board by board. So first of all, we have the George Elliott minutes of the meeting held in November. Um, uh, if there are any errors in that uh, set of minutes, could you please raise a digital hand? Gertie, your digital hand is raised. It, it is, Russell. Um, I just for, for, for this set of minutes and, and all three sets of minutes and equally across the confidential minutes, um, my initials are GP and it's noted as GNP. OK, thank you, Gertie. Um, any other points of error of, uh, or, or correction for the minutes? Please raise a digital hand. This is for the George Elliott board, first of all. Um, Natalie? Sorry, Chair, I think um, Hack has just come in with exactly the same point as I had because it is about his title, so I'll let Hack take over. OK, thank you, Hack. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, I'm down as a, as, as a Ned. Hack, you can only dream of being an aide, um, but thank you. I'm not that good. Um, that's something to look forward to with joy in your heart in the future. And any other points of clarification for George Elliott colleagues? OK, so for George Elliott colleagues, if you're not happy to approve those minutes, could you please raise a digital hand? OK, Julie approved and I'll sign them off. Same for the SWIFT colleagues. Those minutes of the meeting held on the 2nd of November. Uh, do SWIFT colleagues have any um, points of correction or clarification on the minutes? I can't see any hands raised. Um, so if you're not happy to approve them, please raise a digital hand. I'll therefore duly take those as accurate. Thank you. And then the White Valley colleagues, uh, the same set of minutes for the 2nd of November. Um, any points of clarification or uh, correction uh, from colleagues at Y Valley? 
And again, if you're not happy to approve them, please raise a digital hand. Yeah, Julie approved, so thank you. So moving therefore to matters arising. Um, just bear with me. Um, I think we only had um, one, which was a request from Swift Governor. The board members ensure acronyms be avoided in future reports, and if used, then the full explanation be provided. Absolutely, and hopefully that is happening um, in what you're seeing. If you're not, please. Um, uh, show us the errors of our ways um, at the end of the meeting. That would be great. Thank you very much. So like I said, the purpose of the foundation group is to share and identify best practice, but also to challenge one another in terms of uh, performance as to where we can learn from one another. Um, so first of all, we're going to talk about group analytics. <coughs> where we've been doing a lot of work over the last couple of years. And Jane and Hack, you're going to brief us on this. Over to you. I'll, I'll pass over to Hack in a in a moment. Who does uh, does all of the all of the work? Um, so I'm I mean, just people know the group analytic board has been going for a year. So it's um, so it, it's still relatively relatively new, and it's working on that five year strategy. Um, so I, I think it's um, I, I think it's gone it's gone really well. There's a few you know, really important products that have been. Uh, developed so the standardised um, uh, business intelligence system, which is now across all of the organisations, and standardised um, uh, of our uh, integrated performance reports, and obviously the reports that we that we see here as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that progress has been hampered a little bit by the resources that we've got, but um, I, the uh, particularly the heads of information in our organisations have worked really well and effectively together, um, and so they've delivered a lot between them. So, um, so yeah, I think quite a lot of pride of what we've delivered so far, but I'll hand over to Hack for the detail. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, and if I can just kind of expand on some of those things that Jane's uh, just touched on. Yeah, so it is a, a year on since we established the group analytics board. So it's good to have a bit of stock take and reflect on what we have uh, achieved. But I just wanted to start off by a big thank you. And I don't think I do all the work. I think it's the heads of information and information teams that do all the work. So I wanted to have a big shout out to them, really, because uh, I think they've done a really uh, brilliant job uh, under some quite difficult circumstances. I'm also grateful for the um, support uh, from Kim and Katie and the, and the deputy CFOs and the guidance from uh, the group analytics board as well. Uh, that's helped us to kind of get to get to where we are now. Uh, and as Jane said, we've delivered on a number of uh, fronts, uh, despite numerous uh, competing priorities over the, over the last year. Uh, you'll see within the report we've set out the strategic uh, objectives for the group analytics uh, uh, board. Um, but we're focusing on immediate priorities such as data quality, standardisation, automation and development of capacity and capability within the information functions as these will lay the foundations and get us all to a similar level of maturity uh, and that will then help us to create headroom to work on the more advanced objectives such as uh, um, objective three which is about innovative best in class approaches so that's why we, you won't see projects that tick all the boxes and all the objectives so we are deliberately taking that uh, approach of laying those really solid uh, foundations so you'll see within the report the eight projects we have been working on. Some of those, as Jane said, you're more cited on than others. So the um, the IPR and the the group dashboard that is included within the report, they're they're now in business as usual mode. So they're effectively completed projects, barring a few tweaks that we still need to make. Um, we have launched a new project uh, on the uh, standardisation and review of the. Um, of finance and performance executive data packs and we'll take a similar approach to that as we've taken to the uh, to the IPR and that'll help us in terms of being able to compare like for like across the group so that's a really important piece of work and also help the informatics departments in terms of producing standardized uh, data, data packs the um, other uh, area that we've been looking at is data quality which is uh, a really important piece because none of it's going to be worth anything if the data quality if we can't have assurance on the data quality so we have made some progress in terms of applying the data quality kite marks and we're just finalizing the rollout plan for that so have a clear plan of how we're going to go through uh, and apply data quality kite marks to all the indicators we've we've got within the ipr as well as some other priority indicators 
Um, we've taken a big step forward, as Jane said, in terms of implementing uh, Power BI as our analytics and business intelligence tool. Um, the key pieces of work that we're doing at the moment in terms of training our um, uh, information staff to be able to use Power BI and develop the reports. Uh, we're also working on developing a sense of ex excellence for Power BI. Uh, and they are, um, uh, so George Elliott is leading on developing the actual reports in Power BI at the moment because our license for our current BI tool expires first. So we've got theatre's dashboard that uh, we're looking to go live with next week and we'll be sharing that or have shared it across the group as well. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as simple as taking the dashboard from one organisation and plugging and playing in another organisation because you do need to build the data models and that is quite a time consuming process. But we are beginning to get to a position where we're beginning to develop reports within within Power BI. Uh, the other kind of uh, just quickly touching on some of the other uh, projects. Um, the um, we've launched another project to look at the capacity and capability across the informatics functions, and that's about making sure we've got the right structures in place uh, now uh, and the right um, skill sets as well as moving forward. So we've got skilled gaps. How are we going to go about developing uh, the staff that we have got uh, and build on on the on the great skills that we've already got and make sure that we're ready for the future as well as for uh, for what we need what we need now. So I'm not going to go through it, kind of any more of the, the detail really, it is all in the report and I just kind of wanted to um, a flag the, the, the issue that Jane's touched on about resourcing, that is a key issue, we are having discussions about what, uh, um, how we go about resourcing some of this work because it is becoming more and more challenging on top of all the other work that the teams are trying to do. So uh, I think we will need to consider some investment if we are to continue with developing at the uh, uh, some of these projects at a reasonable uh, pace. So in summary, thanks to some great engagement uh, and fantastic leadership and commitment across the three trusts, we're making good progress and we're beginning to see some tangible deliverables come through. And we've got a clear direction of travel in terms of uh, what we're going to deliver next, but that resourcing issue is one that we do do need to um, uh, make some decisions on over the next couple of months. Hack, Jane, thank you very much and thank you for your leadership. Uh, questions and perspectives, um, Glenn? Yeah, thank you both for, for leading on this and, and the wider team's work. It has gone from uh, an idea into something that's um, that really will help us to to improve productivity across the, the three trusts. And it's only actually when you get into that, you realise that you know, all these years that there have been league tables on things that they haven't necessarily been comparing apples with apples. And I think uh, making sure we've got that consistency of approach has been important. I think one of the things that um, it will be good to try and evolve this into, um, and it, I think we expose this a little bit later on in the agenda when we look at urgent care, is starting to think about new measurement of some of the new service models that we have. Um, so, um, you know, because of virtual working, because of the way that our teams are now looking after the, the patients and the communities in a wider sense, I think I think the learning across the group is there for us to to lead the NHS on, on, on a different way of measuring the activity and then potentially link that into research so that we can demonstrate that some of the new service models and, and make the comparisons about how effective they are to the communities. So I think um, so I suppose what I'm saying, Hack, is it, it, fantastic progress, but it kind of whets the appetite for, for, for potentially doing some more in the future, which probably takes you back to that resource question. Yeah, and uh, Ian in the chat box, um, Hack, and I'm not sure if you've seen it, is, is talking about those capacity risks and uh, how we can mitigate them. Um, what would uh, help us to understand? Clearly, we've all got an issue in terms of capacity and um, uh, the ability to invest in things. Is the project at risk because of that? Or do we need to make some other decisions? I think we are looking at lots of different ways of uh, addressing the capacity issue and, and picking up some of the points in the in the chat. We are looking at partnering, particularly with the universities and building on the relationship that SWIFT has already got um, uh, with, with the universities and some of the relationships we're uh, de developing um, 
uh, through the individual organisations as well. So I think something about what can we do through the university, both in terms of a recruitment pipeline, but also where they can help us with some uh, projects as well, where some of their students could take on some some project work. Um, we also, um, um, some of it will require, I think, uh, um, additional resource temporarily uh, while we get over this hump because as we start to automate I think it will take the pressure off the off the teams and free up some of their time to help us then to be able to develop their skills but I think there's a short-term pressure that we need to uh, need to deal with as we as we go through that automation process but we are looking at uh, lots of different ways of doing this and and uh, partnering with various um organizations whether it's it's uh other trusts or whether it's it's university so we are and part of that project on analytical capacity and capability we will review that and work out a way of how we move forward in in, in the most constructive way yeah no absolutely and as glenn has indicated you know we do need to just within the foundation group let alone within region and the nhs get to a position where we're, we're sure we're comparing apples with apples and not confusing ourselves by um, data integrity issues. Any other questions or perspectives from colleagues? OK, team, well, uh, please keep us briefed, Jane and Hack. Thank you for your leadership and please thank the frontline teams, but we do need to keep the momentum going. Um, so we then move on to the Foundation Group performance reports. Um, and. Uh, Unusually for the foundation group, there's a bit of a sea of red um, in the foundation in the in the reports on performance, which I know we all feel um, the pain of. Um, I'll ask the managing directors to go in the order in which the data is presented from left to right. So, um, Jane, do you want to pick up first as Y Valley uh, managing director, please? Uh, yes, will do. Um, uh, and I guess one of the things will uh, be as we go forward to start to measure against the uh, the new national targets rather than the old ones, because a number of those have changed quite significantly for next year. So, we're, so we'll need to build that in from next uh, next April. And um, so, I was just going to touch on three things from a Y Valley uh, perspective. Um, uh, something I'm worried about, something um, I'm proud of, and then uh, I, I'm probably I'm just going to talk a little bit about ED. Uh, we've obviously got the coups talking in more detail later, so I'm not going to go through the uh, through the detail uh, of, of that. But um, it's a uh, it's a it, it's clearly a concerning picture where we are in terms of both sort of national benchmarks and um, and uh, group benchmarks. Um, and um, uh, Andy will talk through later some of the reasons for that and uh, some of the things that we're that we're doing about it. Um, but uh, one thing that isn't on the um, uh, on the paper that I wanted to relay was the focus that um, Y Valley has put on ambulance um, handovers, and you can see that in that um, handovers within 15 minutes metric. I mean, a real concentration on that, and a and a um, organisational effort to say um, we need to protect people in the community who can't get an ambulance. And when I did a bit of um, digging around um, in some of the ambulance data, um, uh, what we found for December, which is this month, uh, we know that nationally uh, the response time for Category 2 ambulances was 90, went to 90 minutes in um, uh, nationally. For the Hereford and Worcestershire ICS, it was exactly the national average. It was it was 90, but that hid quite a lot of detail, which was actually it was around 95 minutes for those people who uh, lived in Worcestershire, but actually around 70 minutes for people in Herefordshire. So, in fact, I've just come off the leaders briefing, monthly leaders briefing um, at, at Wye Valley. And, and to be able to say, you know, this has been really hard and everybody's worked um, under intense pressure particularly that spreading the load across our wards um, and departments with those with those um, boarding patients but actually at you know a 25 minute um, improvement in what would otherwise have been delivered in terms of ambulance uh, response times I, I think is very impressive and the the people we serve will have benefited from uh, from from that um the thing I'm worried about um is uh, is sickness um I think I'd I'd call it a sticky measure because it's really sticky we've put lots of time and effort and thought into reducing our sickness levels at um, at Y Valley but uh, it's fair to say that they still remain um, the highest in the group they benchmark higher 
um, regionally and, um, and and nationally as well. Although uh, although the rest of the group is, I think, is better on the regional and national metrics. So we're only just above those. Um, but we need to redouble our efforts on that. And so next year it's going to be a you know very much a focus for us in terms of reducing um, sickness rates. Because what we've done so far, I think we have to say, um, hasn't um, uh, really hasn't worked. And the thing that I want to talk about is I'm proud of is around the cancer performance. Um, so the 62 day cancer performance and actually for this month, November, it's uh, lower than we're generally um, uh, batting at. Because um, actually in October, we were at 80 percent for 62 and in December we were at 70 percent. So so doing really well on, on cancer, 62, uh, 62 day performance. And uh, so so something we're quite proud of. Jane, thank you. Um, just before I, I move on, and obviously I'll be conscious of time, any questions or perspectives to Jane? OK, thank you, Jane. Um, so um, we are also um, saying goodbye, but not just yet, to Anne Coyle, um, our managing director at SWIFT. Um, but uh, she's uh, kindly staying on a little bit longer than David. Um, so Anne, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. You've, you've touched on the um, significant demand and a tougher flu season that we we, 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 we just um, lived through. And that is very much sort of reflected in our ED and ambulance handover uh, time. And that is, as, as Jane's referenced, uh, explored later in today's uh, meeting. But everything really connects to that and uh, mortality indicators while re remaining within control limits um, included in the narrative is a really detailed explanation providing the commentary and the work underway under the direction of the mortality surveillance um, committee. Our sickness, you know, Jane described as a sticky measure and, 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 um, and we have our own uh, challenges there. Um, you, you, we, we've only reported the date up until November uh, 2022, but it is reassuring. You know, there is that significant work underway. We need to really understand the reasons for our absence and really understanding uh, trends. On our 62-day uh, um, wait for cancer, uh, you know, we have seen those increase in referrals uh, compared with 2019. And, and to put that into context, that's an additional um, 100 referrals per week. Um, on the, the, but the numbers that um, with a confirmed uh, diagnosis have returned to levels um, that we saw pre-pandemic. Um, the work on each of the tumour site pathways is, is, is also outlined in the, in the narrative, and it's really good that we have appointed an ACMO for cancer, really with a specific focus um, on our cancer performance. And we, we're seeing green shoots um, and in, in terms of improvements. Our challenge now is consolidation and building on, on that. In RTT, um, it's really pleasing and really proud um, of, of the work of all of our teams, but to be able to report that we're in the top quartile for RTT and our diagnostic performance. Um, and, and, you know, there, it, it, it shouldn't be underestimated, really, the work that our teams face, that challenge around meeting our cancer demand, delivering our cancer performance and, and maintaining our RTT um, delivery. So, you know, all involved are to be commended for that. And on our medically fit for deep discharge, um, that remains challenged. Glenn's um, in, in, in earlier in the session uh, this morning referenced the work um, for Warwickshire as being part of uh, the discharge front runner site. And so discharge remains a real focus and focus remaining on our pathways, flows into our community and also improving the data. But during this period, we've really had and built on strong relationships with Warwickshire County Council and partners in supporting in, in supporting people who no longer need to be within hospital or within our community teams. Thank you, Chair. That's great, Anne. And, and it's great the level of um, profile SWIFT has had recently with a series of visits from um, national TV um, crews, as well as the chief executive of, of the NHS with Amanda Pritchard done um, coming to visit us. So um, the, the team can be rightly proud. Uh, any questions or perspectives to Anne? Um, Glenn? Yeah, Anne's mentioned discharge, so I, I was going to pick it up at the end, but it's probably a good point to do it now. Um, there's obviously been a huge focus on this and, and the um, the launch this week of the, the National uh, Emergency Care Recovery Plan uh, focuses quite heavily on that. 
I, th I think what's good about the data that we now have across the group is that that, it, that it's that it's robust, uh, and I think in a lot of organisations there the, the, the isn't that clarity of of discharge data, including the opportunities that we have internally for improvement, and that's quite a big feature of the national plan. So I think organisations that, that don't think they have any discharges delayed because of their own internal processes are kidding themselves. So I think it's good to see that we've got into a good place. What that's meant actually for Y Valley is that we've increased the numbers that we're reporting. So that's a combination now of, of patients who are who are waiting for pathways outside of hospital, but also some opportunities to improve processes within. And that's there for all three organisations. And and uh, and the work on, on domiciliary care is important, but it's also important for us to keep on top of the things we're doing internally. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I, Glenn, um, just as you've sort of raised a similar issue to the question I was going to raise, uh, as I understand it, and I think it's important for members of the public to be aware, the, the way that the numbers worked out, we actually can't report a bed occupancy above 100%, can we? Even if in times when we're having to board patients, we're not able to uh, show a number above 100%. So all three trusts have done a phenomenal job um, in coping with exceptional levels of occupancy. So uh, to, to each of the three um, coups, um, I, I give my thanks. Um, uh, so any other questions to Anne? Please raise your digital hand. Sarah, Bastrick. Thanks, Anne. Um, just, just a brief question, really, that you, because you pulled it out, mentioning the, the cancer um, referrals and an increased rate of, of cancer referrals coming in and a return to a cancer diagnosis of pre-pandemic. Is that still within the, um, the expected percentage conversion rates to cancers that you'd like or that we should expect to see from referrals? Or if not, are we doing work with our wider partners to, to look into to reasons for that? And a caveat to any question about cancer and referrals, I guess, in a meeting in public, that people should always come forwards if they've got cancer symptoms and not be put off by any conversation like this. Yeah, of course. And um, maybe I need to ask Harkman as the chair of uh, Cancer Board, which really monitors and oversees the data attributed to each of the tumour sites. And of course, it's likely there will be a particular answer for each one of those uh, tumour sites, I would imagine. Harkman? Yeah, so um, December was the first month that we saw our conversion rate going back down to what we would expect. So um, the two-week wait pathway isn't actually the pathway that generates the most cancer work, and um, which is why it's really important that you never just divert all your resources just to the one pathway. But what we did see um, when we were seeing a significant increase in um, cancer referrals, and we were the one of the highest in the region and one of the highest nationally to see that sustained level of increase was a just over a percent increase in conversion rate, which is statistically considered significant. And you can see the impact now, you know, all the way through the pathways onto radiology, um, uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy, as well as um, uh, the surgical demand. Um, so December was the first month where that tipped back to normal, so it'd be one to watch. Um, but certainly it's something that's still on our radar because obviously one month is, is not um, sort of indicative of anything. And your second part to the question around working with wider partners, absolutely, we've been working with primary care to map out some of these pathways um, and really look at where we can um, try and streamline um, more effectively. So colorectal is a really, really big example of that. And a lot of work has gone into, um, you know, straight to test and and making sure that our, um, we're, you know, the pathway sort of streamlined and everyone knows the, the right route in. And your final point around not um, making sure that people don't turn away um, or don't not come forward. That's exactly the point. So we're really careful with the language. We don't talk about inappropriate referrals and all that sort of stuff that I think perhaps, you know, historically, and um, we used to, partly because we're not seeing that, um, but also it is a good thing that people are coming forward and we, you know, and we do try and encourage that. And certainly that's what all our comms was around and remains about it, to encourage our patients to keep coming forward. Thank you, Harkamel, very clear. And any other questions or perspectives to Anne from the boards? And so last but no means least, um, David Elchingham, George Elliott. 
Thanks, Russell. Uh, so I'm going to say a few words about ED because that has been our um, principal area of focus through the Christmas and New Year period of the really difficult run um, into Christmas. Um, on Christmas Eve, the hospital was more than full. We had um, no spare beds whatsoever and surge capacity open. That's quite an unusual place to be um, on Christmas Eve. And it drove a difficult set of circumstances through the Christmas holidays and into the beginning of the new year. Um, that had a significant impact on four-hour performance and ambulance turnarounds and the teams have worked incredibly hard and I do want to put on record my thanks uh, to the teams for all the effort that they've put in to get additional capacity open and to keep it open in order to maintain flow um, through that critical period. The, um, the, the consequence of that is that we did have um, an increase in the number of ambulance delays. We're usually very good and, and normally sort of top of the shop in terms of turning an ambulances around. Um, we've recovered that quite quickly um, and we also cancelled uh, quite a significant number of, of operations. And uh, again, we've recovered from that quite quickly. If you look at the numbers, though, in terms of uh, performance, we're still um, up there um, in the top uh, 10 uh, for, from a regional perspective and uh, the top quartile nationally. And our performance year to date remains above the 76% threshold that's been set in the newly published Urgent Emergency Care Plan. Um, we're, we're actually performing on a daily basis in excess of 78%. Uh, and so we think that we're going to uh, set ourselves a stretch target rather than um, the national target that was announced um, in, the, uh, in the Urgent Emergency Care Recovery Plan. Uh, that is the right thing to do for our patients um, given the performance position that we report. The themes in the urgent emergency care plan um, relating to uh, same day emergency care really important for us. That's been an area of concentration for us through the Christmas and New Year period. And I'm pleased to report that we've managed to maintain our same day emergency care capacity throughout that really challenging period. And we actually used our same day emergency care units to create some additional inpatient beds. And we were able to quickly relocate our same day emergency care facility to allow it to continue to function. And it's continued to see high numbers of patients um, throughout that really pressed period. Um, and the other thing I want to comment on upon is discharge. Um, so although that's still a challenge for us, we have seen some really good work in partnership with our local authority colleagues um, and internally within the hospital to improve uh, discharges. And we've reduced the number of patients in the first weeks of January um, who are medically fit for discharge uh, by about 50%. And that has significantly helped with flow across the hospital. So some really good work and some really good effort for from clinical and operational teams across the hospital there. In terms of things to still focus on, um, cancer performance, we've seen a small increase in the number of patients waiting more than 62 days for their first uh, cancer treatments, and we're uh, very focused on that. And we still have a small number of patients who are waiting longer than 104 days uh, for that treatment. Each of those patients are case managed, but it's an area of concern for us, and it's an area of focus for us in terms of service improvements. And then finally, just a comment on uh, referral to treatment and elective care. Uh, prior to Christmas, we had a very small number of patients waiting longer than 52 weeks. Um, over the Christmas period, our uh, position has gone backwards slightly, so we've got a slightly higher number of patients um, at, at more than 52 weeks. We've got one patient uh, at greater than 78 weeks, although that patient is dated. That's a, a child waiting for an outpatient appointment. Um, and uh, we're very focused on all of that. Um, one of the good pieces of work that we've done is validating the wait list. The wait list has something like 15,000 um, patients upon it. And um, we validate that we, we now know that we only have 530 patients at greater than 40 weeks. And that is the answer to staying on top of the 52 week and 78 uh, week position going forward. So again, some great work by our uh, operational and clinical teams coming out of the Christmas period to validate that. And they're now staying on top of that. It's being validated on a weekly basis, um, which allows us to, to really grip the, uh, the elective care position. So it's very challenging, uh, but there's lots of great work uh, taking place across the hospital and indeed the system uh, amongst our teams and uh, again just to reinforce that massive thank you to our frontline staff who are doing a great job in some very challenging circumstances. Very well said uh, David. Um, Madge, Rashid, uh, can you come on the line for a second so I can see your done. Thanks Madge. Um, so I'm immensely proud of all three of my um, ED departments during the uh, last couple of months, all three teams have done phenomenally well. But now you've introduced a series of innovations over the last couple of years, and I can't tell you how proud and delighted I am 
um, for the way the George Elliott team have been able to be up amongst the very best in the country in, in terms of uh, ED performance. So um, on behalf of all of the boards, thank you, all the teams very much. But Nadge, you're a star and it's great to have you at this table. Um, so other questions and perspectives to David Elchenham. Um, David Mowbray? Yeah, it was on that point, um, Russell, that impressive ED performance. Uh, ha have you done, yeah, obviously you have because you've just mentioned it, but what have you done specifically to encourage flow through your hospital uh, with your inpatient medical teams? David, do you want Nadge to talk about that or do you want to take it on the chair? Absolutely. No, that, that's Nadge's um, area of specialty, so let's bring him in. Uh, happy to uh, take that. So it's developing those relationships, David. We really worked on our relationships with the medical team, the surgical team, the, the subspecialties of surgery, of Sky and EP, everyone. We've improved alternative uh, pathways like FSEC, SAU. Um, working with the um, uh, EPAU as well, go through that. And then that's work with our partners within the organisation, but also setting the mindset within the department as well. So senior leadership, you know, we're blessed in having a lot of uh, filled all our consultants uh, and all very highly trained clinicians who regularly review patients and actually Discharge quite a bit. Our conversion rate is uh, around 10 11 percent. That in itself is, you know, I think a really bigger. Whereas nationally, I think something around 25 30 percent. So we re regularly refer to the department, uh, the patient, and try and make sure that all those referrals that do go through specialties are, you know, they really do. And as I said, it's, it's, that, it's those relationships, specialties we worked on. Uh, and I think. Nadge, that, that's great. It's a little bit difficult to hear you, Nadge, at our end, but maybe D David and Bhaskar um, colleagues want to have a, a, another meeting to talk about some of the learnings out of George Elliott, but um, uh, Nadge, you, you've done some great leadership work there. Thank you. Um, other questions or perspectives to David Elchenham? OK, we, before we move on, Glenn, you know, as chief executive, how are you feeling about the foundation group's performance during this tight time? I've been incredibly impressed by the way that the teams have responded. I think there are always moments where uh, any any part of the NHS can, can be overwhelmed, uh, particularly with the demand that we've seen over the past few months. But I think the test of, of a good system is always how well it recovers and how quickly it recovers and I think the recovery uh, of of our position over the, the 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 January period particularly has has been really impressive to see and I think and that and that that's meant that we've had to work quite hard to get things back into shape to get the ambulatory areas back into functioning to get all the patients in all the right beds um which uh, which which means you put yourselves under even more pressure as you recover but but that means that we're delivering safer faster care to our patients so uh, it's been well worth doing so uh, and what i've particularly enjoyed is just is just seeing the way that the clinicians and managers work together uh, so well um and um uh, and you know they've 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 met a few challenges over the past few months and it's hard to imagine whether there's anything that could beat them uh, in the future because um, because the response has been so positive. That's great, Glenn. And, and again, just obviously um, NHS boards are very much looking at what has happened. Just in terms of where we are at the moment and um, are, are we seeing the, the bounce back that members of the public would be hoping for in terms of performance, despite the strikes and other things going on? Yeah, I, I mean, we've been watching carefully the the incidence of flu in the community, and that's been encouraging. We I shared a, a chart this morning in in workshop on that, so we have definitely seen a reduction in demand, uh, which has been welcome over the past uh, two or three weeks. Um, although I would say that December was the highest ever period of demand for the NHS, so so you know it's it's all relative, but. Um, I suppose one thing that surprised me a little bit is that we, we, after the individual days of industrial action, that we've not seen the bounce back in, in ambulance arrivals that I thought we would see. 
Um, uh, and I suppose one of my worries here is that the community are not coming forward um, in in the way that they they perhaps should or could. Um, and, and that could mean that we get sicker patients presenting later. Um, so I think we just have to be very careful as we watch this scenario over the next few weeks. No, very wise. And it sort of goes back partly to what um, I think Sarah Rastrick and uh, Harkamer were saying uh, to members of the public. Um, the NHS is there for you. If you need us, reach out to us. If you've got any symptoms that cause you an anxiety, uh, please do reach out. It's your NHS. Um, we're here to help you. Um, any other questions to the three MDs? Otherwise, we'll move on. Now, I know for many members of the public, NHS finances are something that probably fill your heart with joy, um, particularly the um, innate details in which the NHS organises its finances. So the next thing on our agenda is the financial planning of, uh, assumptions we've been given for 23, 24 and its implications. Um, just before we go into um, the presentation from the three finance officers, Glenn, could you just give us a, a quick overview as to how you're seeing the changes um, at, at a macro level, please? Very happy to, Russell. Um, NHS finance is a, a never quick, <laughs> though, uh, so I, I will I'll, I'll do my best to summarise where we are. I mean, obviously, over the last three years, we've been going through COVID and the, it needed a, a change to the financial regime. So during that period, a lot of our income has been given to all three trusts on a block basis, including some top up funding to, to manage the implications of COVID. Uh, so we're now weaning ourselves out of that process as an NHS um, and uh, that top up funding is going away um, and uh, we're moving back to a regime which um, is more based on the activity that we do. So from an urgent care perspective, uh, we're still going to be funded on a broadly block basis, but there's a lot of moving parts within that which um, our, our finance colleagues will talk about in a moment. Um, and indeed, within that, one of the biggest pressures is the are the workforce gaps and and the costs of premium uh, labour, which uh, I, I'd like us to just um, spend a little bit of time looking at at the moment. So that's one part of it. But the other part of it that is changing uh, and going back to something a bit more familiar to the likes of me is is around elective care, moving to what's called payment by results, which is um, being paid for the uh, individual bits of activity that we do from an elective perspective. Um, I think that is necessary, uh, certainly for this coming year and potentially for two or three more years, as we deal with this backlog problem of numbers of patients on the waiting list. I think once we've dealt with that, and we've got ourselves back into a, a more normal scenario. There's probably an argument to go back into a capitation based model for that piece of activity. But what finance uh, directors will talk about in a, in a moment is is uh, a need to plan for the coming year which will soon be upon us and uh, a degree of uncertainty around some of the elements of that block funding uh, as well as uh, uncertainty about how we can model the, the amount of elective work we're going to do and hence the income that comes with it so it's uh, it's 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 not a it's not an easy scenario to work through but I think one thing that uh, will need to be watched very carefully this year, and I'll come back to this under any other business, is the need to ensure that we do, we uh, can deliver uh, productivity improvements um, that demonstrate that some of the investments we've put into capacity deliver uh, the activity that we thought that they would deliver. So we're doing a lot of work across that on the group to, um, to make sure that we um, we share best practice and, and look at productivity. But I think elsewhere in the NHS, I think this will expose some quite big financial issues um, where the activity isn't being delivered and therefore the income will not be gained by those organisations and it could be some big deficits that, that will need to be explained. So uh, hopefully we'll be in a better place, but the chief finance officers will talk us through that in a moment. That's great. Thank you for that contextualisation, Glenn. So, Hack, Kim and Katie, over to you. Thank you, Chair, and um, apologies for putting the slides up a little bit uh, prematurely there. If I um, start and then I'll hand over to Kim and Hack to, to pick up as we go through. So, hopefully that's changed for colleagues on the gallery. 
Super. So just starting off with a little bit of the, the national context around um, financial position and financial plans. So in the autumn statement in November, we understood that uh, health spending was going to increase in revenue terms by um, an extra £3.3 billion. And um, that was separate to social care funding, which will also see further increase. And, and capital funding was, as previously described, broadly. And, and what that increased investment does is it gives some shielding for us for some of those inflationary pressures that we're inevitably seeing. What does that mean as it translates into the, the guidance and the planning um, environment for 23-24? Well, at a national level, the allocations that have been um, published for systems are flat in real terms. So broadly, we will have the same money that we have today to deliver everything we need to deliver into next financial year, although there is some targeted capacity funding also available. For any systems that are consuming more than what the, the formula would suggest is their fair share, there will be a, what's called a convergent adjustment, which basically seeks to reduce their funding towards that fair shares level over time. And both systems, Herefordshire and Worcestershire and Coventry and Warwickshire, um, have a convergence adjustment as part of their, their allocation formula. And in return for that extra funding that um, has been invested, the NHS is expected to make further efficiencies and deliver improved performance. And particularly in the context of next year and the financial plans, we're required to plan to deliver a balanced net system financial position. So break even um, or surplus at a system level. And clearly in the context in which we're operating, that's challenging. But nonetheless, that's the, the expectation of us all uh, in terms of that national funding settlement. If I move it on then, so what does that mean for, for us as a foundation group? So just a little bit of context in terms of where we all are, all are currently. So the current financial year has been challenging. There's been a number of drivers to that, and those drivers are largely consistent across the group organisations. We've seen upward pressure from excess inflation, and particularly where we have material contracts, such as the, the PFI contract at Y Valley and the impact of the energy prices. Recruitment and retention and our workforce challenge we talk about in, in a number of contexts through, through Group Board and clearly all of the organisations have experienced challenges there and that drives a really uh, high reliance on temporary workforce at premium cost and Kim will touch on that more shortly. Across the NHS, as, as Glenn's just described, we know that there are further opportunities to continue to drive productivity improvement back to pre-pandemic levels and, and again Hack will we'll come on to that a little bit later. In the current year, each of the group trusts is working really hard within their systems to deliver the plan in the current year. So to do what we said we would do and what we set out to do at the start of the year. And clearly that's not without risk. And we've touched on the operational pressures that we've seen over recent weeks. And, and that all adds to the, the pressure we experience in, in delivering what we said we would do on the finances. But of course, it's worth remembering that the in-year position, particularly this year, isn't necessarily an indicator of our underlying positions as we exit the year. So across all of the group organisations, our positions in this financial year have been supported by significant non-recurrent income streams and other non-recurrent measures. And what that means is as we exit this financial year, collectively, our positions are underlying deficit positions rather than that break even or, or better position that we need to plan for moving forward. So as we start to develop and, and understand the guidance and develop our plans in terms of 23-24 with a particular focus on productivity improvement and financial sustainability, we do that in the context of starting from an underlying deficit position across the group. And I'll hand over to Kim to give a little bit more context on those group financials before we move on to the productivity opportunity. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. So, so, the, so we've uh, collated the information across the three organisations um, and you will see the first chart shows the um, monthly uh, run rates by um, each organisation. So I uh, hope that you can uh, see the uh, legends there. So you'll see for the monthly uh, trends, they are pretty much very similar uh, in terms of um, um, uh, how, how they flow. And um, the, the key thing is that it's an increasing uh, run rate over the last uh, few years. The, 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 the WOW is a weighted activity unit, so that uh, shows you again the trend in terms the trend in terms of activity. And again, very similar uh, patterns in terms of our weighted activity units. And you'll see that all three trusts uh, have recovered from uh, where, from the, the peak really, I suppose, of, of COVID um, that you see in terms of that, that dip there. 
in order to make the information much more comparable though we've converted that into a, a cost per well that you'll see uh, on the bottom uh, left hand side uh, chart so that you can uh, actually compare uh, the, the three organizations and how we're performing again you'll see very very similar uh, patterns uh, you'll see though in the last uh, few months uh, where we were beginning to see some improvements really in terms of our cost per well for three organizations but the cost per well uh, started to uh, increase uh, due to the uh, operational pressures that all three organizations have experienced. Um, moving on, so you, you'll be aware that 70% uh, of our expenditure relates to uh, pay. And one of the uh, key drivers for our expenditure position is the use of uh, temporary staffing, but more specifically uh, agency uh, staffing. Um, the graphs on the right show the uh, spend amounts, uh, but the graphs on the left uh, show these as a percentage of the total pay bill, which allows us to actually compare uh, the, uh, the three trusts. Now, again, you'll see that the graphs pretty much show very similar trends uh, with, uh, with the expenditure uh, 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 you know, increasing. Um, but the key issue is we've got flat uh, funding allocations and, and that clearly presents some uh, challenges really uh, for uh, next year. But again, uh, as Glenn mentioned, the return to PBR um, uh, will also give us a, an opportunity around uh, elective um, uh, income. Um, the, 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 the growth around the last two years across all three trusts, uh, you know, we, we talked about it in the last, uh, last uh, me, uh, three boards meeting, primarily linked to higher emergency demand uh, and also to a higher acuity of uh, patients leading to, you know, investment in terms of capacity uh, with new wards opening and SDEC areas, as well as investment in, in diagnostics. Um, the recruitment and retention challenges have impacted on our increasing cost of our temporary uh, workforce. And again, you know, uh, said you'll see these similar uh, uh, trends really uh, across uh, the organisations. But there's some key, uh, uh, there's some differences as well. So George Elliott's uh, spend overall has remained fairly, mean spend has remained fairly consistent, um, but also has, uh, it seems to have high bank as a percentage of uh, their pay as well as high agency as a percentage of pay. Um, meanwhile, Y Valley's mean spend has increased uh, and has a low bank as a percentage of pay, but high agency as a percentage of pay. Uh, now this is because of the re reality of population demographic um, uh, in, in Y, which hampers their ability to grow their bank. Um, and I understand that agency nurses also have to travel significant distances from out of area to uh, come to work in Y, which has an impact in terms of their rates. Um, the SWIFT mean spend uh, has also increased, uh, but, but, but again has a spend, uh, bank spend as a percentage of pay in between uh, Georgia and Y, uh, and at relatively lower agency as a percentage of pay. Now, all three trusts have had some successes um, in terms of recruitment, but again, increased capacity has meant that we have seen, uh, you know, the uh, we haven't seen the reduction in temporary staffing that we might have expected. So our temporary staffing costs uh, remain uh, high. Now, all trusts are being are or are being tasked to reduce their agency as a percentage of pay to a percentage of 3.7%. Uh, so all, all three organisations have work programmes to deliver this. Uh, the analysis that we share today uh, really uh, show really how we work together. It's an example of how the three uh, CFOs and teams uh, work together to, do, to look at these uh, 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 the analytics uh, to help uh, direct some of the work. Uh, and again, uh, we're sharing some of the predictivity uh, analysis uh, tools that we've developed in SWIFT as well across the group. Uh, but I'll hand over to Hack really to talk a bit more uh, about what we're doing uh, to address uh, these issues. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, so bearing in mind the requirements of the planning guidance and the challenges that Kim and Katie have set out, the question is what are we 
doing about it. Uh, and they, the good news is that we've got uh, we're focusing on the key uh, on, on the key areas that we need to focus on. Um, uh, they don't change in, in the light of those challenges. So I think we're doing the right things. And this slide gives a flavour of some of the key projects. It's not an exhaustive list of everything that's in train and some of the labelling might change as we uh, realign some of these uh, projects with the refreshed uh, strategies, but essentially it gives you a, a good flavour of all the work that's going on across all three organisations. Um, and drawing out some of those key areas, the workforce clearly you can see from those uh, slides a big, a big challenge in terms of temporary staffing costs. So there continues to be a focus on recruitment and retention. And David Mowbray in the chat has, has made one of the points I was going to uh, draw out, which is about the importance of efficient and effective rostering so that we can make sure we're deploying uh, the staff that we've got available in the most effective way, but also around ma absence management and, and, the, and the importance of really effective absence management. Uh, so there's clearly uh, a pressure on temporary pay rates as well. Uh, that we will all be familiar with, you know, particularly in light of the the, the BMA uh, uh, rates for the for the medics, and we will need to manage that uh, challenge going forwards as well. Productivity, Glenn's mentioned how important this is going to be going forwards, and there's a number of projects that we're already focusing on uh, across the board to improve uh, productivity. Um, so we've got various projects around theatres and that patients and improving throughput through those areas. And as Glenn said, it's going to be more important than ever going forward on the basis that uh, we will be paid for the number of patients that we treat, which creates an opportunity, but also a potential risk if we're not able to treat the number of patients that we need to treat. So productivity going forward is going to uh, take on a, a greater degree of importance than it has had in the in the, in, in the past. But We've got various projects in, in train already, well-established projects across all three organisations to help us to improve productivity. Uh, but to enable us to drive productivity, we need to be able to manage, manage and contain urgent and emergency care demand within available resources. Uh, and in that front, we've also invested in virtual wards, ambulatory care and various elements of integrated care to support uh, discharge of patients uh, and also enable patients to be so, um, uh, supported appropriately uh, in the most appropriate uh, environment which doesn't necessarily have to be within the hospital and, and you can see there's a number of projects uh, that describe that. So in short we're focusing on the right things but there is a lot of it is one of the things that comes across on this slide. On, on this slide. Uh, so to help us to rise to the challenge of continuing to deliver within a constrained financial envelope, um, we do need to take some steps to uh, change gear. And to do that, I think that means focusing on a few things and doing them really well. Uh, so how could we do this? Uh, so we need to be thinking about what elements should we focus on? How do we share and assimilate good practice uh, rapidly? Uh, and what do we need to collaborate on? And that's probably a good point to stop and open it out for debate and discussion. No, really clear uh, series of slides, Hack. And just as I open it up, um, Glenn mentioned earlier, this year we'll spend about £50 million on agency costs, which is a horrific number. Uh, those agencies will earn at least a 25% gross margin high profit. So even if we paid the agency staff ourselves, what the agency pays them, there's still 12 and a half million, 25% of 50 million, 12 and a half million of potential savings if we didn't use agency at all, but we paid their staff exactly what they're being paid by the agency. It's an enormous opportunity, apart from all the issues we know around safety and productivity of agency staff. So agency for me is something we really do need to batter down on um, this year. We're losing many, many millions um, as an NHS and across the foundation group to agencies profit. Um, questions and perspectives um, on that presentation, Glenn? So yeah, I was just going to pick up on the the agency issue as well, Russell. I, I, you know, it's um, it's doubled, it's more than doubled in this three year period. Uh, and it's a huge amount of resource. Um, uh, and in addition to that, uh, the use of some agencies um, brings with it um, some staff who are unfamiliar with our systems and processes and therefore brings safety and quality risks. So it's it's bad on, on so many fronts. 
Um, the, the, the slides that Kim took us through, I think it's important for us to separate the temporary labour of bank usage, particularly in nursing from agency, because actually having a, a nurse bank using that workforce flexibly as part of a, a managed roster system is actually what we want to do. And, and we want to encourage more flexible working across the group. So banks are good, but agencies are generally not. And there's two types of agency, actually. And that's what I just wanted to emphasize. Those that are on framework, where we've got uh, an agreed price that's gone through a procurement process, but also the assurance that those individuals have had suitable training uh, and are, are able to fulfill the roles is one part of this. I'd, I'd obviously like to minimize that through recruitment and use of bank, but the off framework agencies where we are paying a premium uh, and where there isn't the same um, assurance that those individuals are uh, are able to fulfill, fulfill the roles in the way that we need them to. There are certain agencies that operate very much on a agency of last resort basis. Um, I'll, I'll mention one, Thornbury, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very keen for us to ensure that we don't use those kind of agencies. You know, their 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 costs are uh, an absolute premium, but alongside that, our ability to be assured. Uh, that they understand our local systems and processes um, in all um, off framework agencies are a concern. So I think we we absolutely need to use our combined effort, all the all the skills that we have and understanding that we have effective rotor management, um, promoting the organisations and actually being one of our staff and having access to training and research and all other opportunities is is something we need to we need to really focus on and and and. Mm -hmm. Over the course of this year, we really do need to be drilling down into the run rate and looking at it at individual wards and departments uh, and getting on top of it. Very well said, Glenn. And if anyone's going to earn high salaries, um, I wanted to be our staff working overtime. Um, and those off framework agencies are a um, uh, are cancer on uh, on the NHS, and but we, we need to do everything we can to get rid of it. Um, other perspectives, Andrew? Yeah, it's just um, uh, a little bit of disappointment, really, that um, there seems to be recognition that there's huge potential in rostering, sickness, job planning, capacity management. Those are all issues which have been which are in our gift and have been around for a long time, um, where we've got large workforce gaps due to national recruitment gaps, uh, issues, shortages. We can understand that, but the internal management processes surely have to be things that are fixed. No, good challenge, Andrew. I mean, Glenn, what would your perspective be on why it's taken so long on some of these issues, given that we've been talking about them for a long while? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a certain pandemic happened um, which I, I won't dwell on too much, but um, um, certainly in terms of the impact on the sickness levels in, in lots of parts of our workforce, that that's we 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 we've had abnormal sickness, and and actually that's continued a little bit over over the last period. So you know if you look at go back to our performance report a moment ago, we've still got higher sickness levels than we would uh, normally have, uh, and I think some of that needs to be challenged more when we're reviewing our occupational health services, for example, across all three trusts at the moment. Um, all three trusts have processes in place to get a, a tighter grip on this though, Andrew, and I, I accept the, the challenge that we need to get back into some normality um, on, on those challenges and to use the effective tools of roster management to, to use the strength of the group actually on things like job planning and comparative performance of, of, of teams so we can we can challenge some of the uh, the productivity issues that we've already touched upon. Um, so I think the, the the medical agency reduction programs, the nurse agency reduction programs, and and the other disciplines are all are all consuming quite a lot of management time at the moment. I think that's quite right. Um, uh, so um, I, I, I my my challenge to all three teams is to get a clear trajectory of how what we think we can do that's that's a that's a stretch one that we can build into our 
um, our CPIP plans for this year. Uh, and then I think, you know, there's, there's an accountability down to, to team and specialty and trust level then on, on whether we can deliver them. And some good, as you made reference to Andrew, some good things in the chat box from David Mowbray and Bascal on that very issue. So look forward to um, the three uh, medical directors sharing best practice. Glenn, your hands back up. Yeah, there was another issue for me that I was I was going to touch on under any other business, but it feels uh, more relevant to discuss this now. So the slide that hacked took us through at the end there refers to the um, the PACE programme, the Productivity and Clinical Effectiveness programme, um, which David Mowbray has been leading on. David Moon, uh, our group strategic financial advisor, has been assisting in that as well. And that's that's uh, a programme that's uh, that has, has gathered gathered PACE. Uh, over over the last uh, year or so, and um, we'll be looking a little bit later in our confidential meetings some of the output of that. But I would like us to uh, get a bit more grip and accountability on the delivery of some of these opportunities. So through this process, at specialty level, um, we identify potential savings and from those productivity gains for each trust. Um, and I think this forum is a perfect forum for us to to capture those in, in summary form and hold ourselves to account that we're actually setting about the delivery uh, of those opportunities. Um, Chief Operating Officers will, will will not want me to say this, but I think a lot of the capacity to 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 implement those changes sits with them and their 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 their, their management teams. Um, so m my proposal moving forward, Russell, is that we 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 add a, a slot to the agenda of this three boards meeting, which is obviously quarterly, that picks up and tracks the outputs of those individual specialty meetings, and uh, and we ask the the chief operating officers to 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 let us know how that implementation is going, and again those are tracked then into our CPIT programs for the year. Yeah, I think uh, that that sounds like a very good idea, Glenn. And I think this this almost this new financial year becomes a year of no excuses for us. Um, not that I'm saying we've been uh, had a victim mentality or an excuse mentality before, but this is a year where we really need the benefits of the foundation group to come through in in droves uh, by this collaboration and this uh, working together. OK, team, um, thank you for that presentation, uh, finance colleagues. We now go on to a discussion uh, from our uh, operational colleagues on urgent and emergency care productivity and measurements. So I'm not sure who's leading off on this, but over to you. I am Russell, if I may. Of course. Um, can you see that? Yes, we can. OK, so. Um, uh, just on the back of your comments there, Rose Russell, on working together and moving forward at pace. Um, uh, our, ourselves as a group of chief operating officers have been working with our information colleagues to look at our urgent and emergency care productivity, building on some of the work we started early in the year on um, working on our, our outpatients and some of the differences in productivity there and new to follow up ratios in our 100 day discharge challenge. Um, I just will put a, a health warning on this. This is our first cut of our urgent and emergency care data and as Glenn said earlier um, in terms of that apples and apples and apples and pears we're still working through an awful lot of that um, but this is uh, at the beginning of our benchmarking of um, some key measures um, and it's an involving portfolio of a collaborative measures on productivity and productivity opportunities but very much a a work in progress. So if I move on to the next slide, uh, just to say this will be a sort of a team effort between myself, Harkamel and Phil, but I'm starting off. Um, and this is quite fortuitous, as Glenn has already said, we've got the timely release of, of the NHS England uh, delivery plan for recovery and urgency and emergency care services that came out on Monday. Um, and we've built a, a, a whole dashboard and portfolio of, uh, of matrix that sit behind this is not quite in a position to share just yet. So here are some of the sort of high level um, indicators that we've started to look at, um, particularly for December. And we've already mentioned that December was 
particularly challenging month, but we just want to take this opportunity to look at some of the some of the challenges in uh, that we've had in in uh, December, some of the actions we took to address, and more importantly, some of the learning, and then um, even more importantly, just some of the next steps of um, how we're going to work to address to to work together, and how we're going to address the some of the productivity challenges and opportunities we've got across our urgent and emergency care pathway. So in terms of December, already mentioned by managing directors and, and Glenn and yourself at the beginning of the meeting, uh, Russell, um, our attendances uh, had a sustained pressure over, over December, as well as our ambulance conveyances, although they weren't significantly high to some, some peaks we've seen um, in, in the recent year and um, pre-pandemic, but was a significant level of, of pressure. What we did see, though, is is high out, high acuity, um, mainly being driven by uh, COVID, um, seasonal flu, strep A, the spike in cold weather, which did lead to um, some uh, increased delays in patients getting to the most appropriate care setting and increase in medically fit for discharge across all three trusts. And it was exacerbated by some of the significant staffing challenges that all three hospitals faced in his David alluded to in his, his uh, uh, summary of the George Elliott position. I don't think any of our trusts saw that pre-Christmas uh, present of a lull in um, uh, bed occupancy. We all see a, saw a massive increase in bed occupancy prior to Christmas and exceeding Christmas as well. Um, but as teams, we make difficult decisions around balancing the risk across all three trusts, but also across our health systems with the priority aim to releasing ambulance crews and easing EG, ED con congestion. And that was you know, successful across all three trusts in comparison to the rest of the region and across the rest of the nation as well. And because of that, we were a, a net importer of ambulance conveyances, which brought with it its own challenges in terms of repatriation patients and um, some of the challenges our, our teams felt in ED. Uh, the following two slides there are just some context for a model hospital on the sort of type one attendances that we saw um, this year and over the last couple of months, which didn't peak as such, um, uh, but was pretty sustained, um, as well as some of our emergency admissions. And on that note, I'll hand over to Harkamal. Thank you. So um, when we started this piece of work, we um, obviously had the conversation about um, what it is we all we all do and how we manage productivity. And then when we um, received the first cut of the data for December, um, for all the reasons that um, Andy's just explained, it was a really challenging month. So we tried to compare some of the actions that we took just to compare, you know, as a hot debrief, what what worked, what didn't work and um, what impacted significantly on productivity and efficiency and, you know, would be lines that we wouldn't cross again for those reasons, but also for patient and staff, patient safety and staff. Um, satisfaction um, and you know I suppose sometimes there's safety in numbers knowing that everyone's made these difficult decisions and that every single organisation or all well, three of us um, bedded into all of our assessment areas um, so when we then try to map across the productivity benefits of having our SDECs open it's clear um, we aren't as efficient <laughs> when we're bedded into our assessment areas and one of the things that we want to do moving forward is a bit of benchmarking on when it works well what does that look like and um, how can we sustain that um, just by way of a very quick summary, we all also corridor nursed. Um, there were patients in additional bays in um, in every organisation, um, some more than others. The elective bit was really interesting because we took the we at Swift took the decision to um, reduce our elective footprint, but to ma maintain as much throughput as we could by changing some of the case mix. But um, other um, uh, partners, so wise. Um, had to reduce or remove um, some elective capacity just to sort of get us through that flow. Um, we had um, opened additional beds into our community hospitals, but essentially all of our escalation beds were open. So to try and do that comparison of what our productivity opportunities were, essentially what this proves is that if you go, if you're too busy and you're too full, you are not as productive and efficient as you could be. Um, and the best practice modelling does say that if you're ending above 83 and 85 percent, um, then, you know, your flow is really hampered and we were all above 100 percent. 
I mean, just by some by way of reflection, when we talk about being full, we were full everywhere. So nationally um, and locally, there was um, very limited and on some days um, extremely limited um, ITU capacity on both the adult and the paediatric side. So we had to enact our ITU surge capacity, which essentially just means finding additional spaces for our poorliest of patients. When I talked before about moving patients and placing extra patients in all of our um, assessment areas and into our wards, we also had significant staffing shortages. And what we saw and what all three of us were able to report back was that actually the efficiency is significantly reduced. While staffing may have been safe, if you don't have enough numbers to discharge some of these patients and follow those complex pathways along, everything just slows down. Um, and I think that's going to be a really key metric for us moving forward in terms of trying to manage um, some of that and learn from each other in terms of what, what practically can we do to make sure that we are working as effectively as possible and removing some of those barriers that, that mean that you, you are resilient to some of those um, staffing gaps. We did see significant ambulance handover delays um, and one of the reasons why we went into escalation capacity was to try and um, reduce some of that and safeguard in the community. But it is a bit of an indicator of how productive an organisation is because even against this backdrop, we, we all remained a net importer of ambulances, not just from within our own regions, but out of area referrals as well. Um, which was really, really challenging to move to manage. For the first time, we had tarmac to tarmac moves. So patients who might have been waiting on the tarmac at a particular hospital for a, a long period of time move around the system to, to us because we, you know, we had lower delays. But actually that's you know it really hampers efficiency. That it's a it's a double handover in some cases, patients just wait longer, and actually it takes quite a lot of time then. It's just additional time in terms of that handover, not to mention, you know, some of that. Um, the anxiety that our, our staff sort of face. The out of area conveyancing, it's been really interesting because we've all done a piece of work um, on this. And what we've learned is that it, whilst the, it is significant, um, actually our out of area patients tend to wait a shorter amount of time and are discharged quicker, which does suggest that the patients that we're getting tend to be the, the safer patients to transfer out of area. That doesn't, however, um, account for the, the time to try and move some of these patients through their, their pathway. Um, and moving forward with that, trying to transfer patients back, um, we faced significant delays with that. And all in all, it was that constant balance of risk and all of us um, were on the highest level of alert that we that we sort of could be. So if you take that forward then and look at what happened to our average length of stay for us at Swift, and if you want to move the slides forward, um, we had quite we had a very high acuity, um, as did everyone. But for us, that was noticeable. So it wasn't that our length of, of stay sort of um, it wasn't that we had a higher level of attendances. It's that the patients that we were getting were so poorly. Um, however, when you're we talk about how you compare the data, it we have also introduced a medical day case um, unit at Swift which the other two organisations don't have in the same way. So you can't compare the length of stay in the same way without taking some of that out. Um, and I think that's really key because the average average length of stay for us has to be a key marker of one of our productivity measures. And I think that was really teased out when we were doing our um, analysis. By way of trying to manage some of our um, acuity, um, we developed a compassionate care work stream at um, SWIFT. And essentially that was um, staff from around the hospital who were not in um, uh, clinical or patient facing roles to come and support. So finance, for example, we had um, uh, HR um, colleagues from support services coming to try and support on the boards. But in turn, that then has a productivity impact down the line. And it's a case of really managing that. And I think when we think about what our average bed occupancy is, we haven't been below 95% for years. So when we think about those extremist things, I think we need to be um, really cognizant of what the product is activity and efficiency impact of that is. And that's one of the things that we've all sort of agreed as coups that we're, we're going to try and somehow map out. And as I've already alluded to, we reviewed the out of area length of stay, expecting to come here with um, an explanation of why that's um, causing us as a, a very significant issue. And it is, but not in the way that we thought. Um, Andy, over to you. Uh, in Y Valley, uh, uh, the impact on us putting additional patients on the wards, we were we were putting a fifth patient and four bedded bays on a number of our wards and some of our wards had a, an additional five or six additional staff with with fewer patients uh, fewer uh, with five or four additional patients on each ward with fewer staff to manage that and that increased our complex discharge um, and to manage that we increased our complex 
discharge team capacity, as well as creating a, a seven day a week discharge hotline to our silver control room, um, supported by adult social care and increase the number of uh, ward discharge coordinators we had on our wards. Uh, a six, significant challenge, but we did start to see some, some, some movement on particular days, but with the high volume of patients on the wards and the significant numbers of reduced staffing, um, there were some delays, particularly on uh, timely referrals and progressing it, uh, just some of the basic discharges on patients on a sort of pathway, uh, a pathway zero discharges. Uh, Phil? Yeah, very, very similar actually, George Elliott, that we concentrated on our ESTEC medical capacity enhancing that because as Harkamal said the acuity was high we tried to make sure that any possible patient we could get out of ED as fast as possible to improve handover times we did and as safely as possible so we enhanced our ESTEC capacity through medical expertise to make sure that decisions were supported the nurses felt supported. <clears throat> I think we did eight until eight and we tried to increase those hours in the week till 10 o'clock but we found in some cases it later in the it wasn't worth it at all for the extra resource we weren't getting the throughput. But actually, um, what we did do was moved ESTEC uh, into another area of the hospital to recreate some more super surge capacity. And the ESTEC support of a &E is still roughly about 20% of the take every day, 20% of attendances every day. So although we moved them and they cooperated very well, we still managed to keep the throughput of the right patients through ESTEC to try and make sure that the, the right patients were admitted and people weren't stuck in ED inappropriately. Um, as Harkel said, we reviewed the out of area length of stay, but it didn't produce the results people thought it would. Um, our length of stay for out of area wasn't as long as we thought. And I think that's um, due to the good collaboration with WMAS, because when they did divert, we were in constant contact, so we'll divert the right type of patients that don't need to go somewhere else, or we can turn around quite quickly. Oh, we increased well, our virtual wall capacity as well. Sorry, sorry, Andy. Well done, you. A little conscious of the time, guys, and a couple more slides. Back with you. So, um, we've referenced our same day emergency care because um, clearly um, urgent care isn't just about ED. Um, and the impact of bedding into those areas um, is very clear and, and sort of evidence. We ran a PDSA last week um, to review the impact of our, if we were to open and extend all the opening hours of our um, SDEC areas, what impact that would that have on flow? And we've learned some brilliant lessons on that. So um, a key action that we're going to take out here is just to share some of that learning to see if we can replicate that across the group. Andy? Yeah, so about says there in terms of Y Valley, we didn't bed into our SDEC areas. However, we didn't see the SDEC performance that we've seen in previous months. And even though we've not increased uh, uh, senior clinician within our SDEC over uh, five, if not seven days of the week during the period, um, we, we didn't see the increase in our SDEC opportunities. And that was mainly driven by the, the acuity that we saw through ED. Although we do think going forward based on some of the work happen, happening in, in SWIFT in particular is how else can we increase our SDEC opportunity? Although Y Valley does extremely well at that, um, there are further opportunities, particularly with our acute floor footprint, which um, in our sort of post pandemic uh, world is probably not the most effective or productive field. Yeah, well, um, I, I've said some of that already that we didn't, uh, we tried to protect SDEC as much as possible. And we did manage to keep the flow through for appropriate patients. But I think in terms of what Glenn said this morning about the focus on process, what we did do, and this is um, good work between ED and medicine, was instead of uh, relying on people and negotiating patient movement, we, we agreed that there'd be criteria and you move. So in other words, in terms of truncating the process, ED agreed with medicine, if this patient fits this is this criteria, we're sending them on to you. So it reduced the handovers and enabled the flow to move more quickly and we could get patients patients out of ED more quickly that didn't need to be there and that really did help actually ED a lot at key moments it wasn't quite the panacea I think everybody hoped about six months ago but it certainly made a difference and it shows if you do focus on the detail of process and the delays sometimes in handover that are well intentioned you can actually improve the patient experience by agreeing things in advance 
and getting them getting people moving safely so there you go so in terms of next steps um as i said at the beginning with lots of work to do in finalizing that um portfolio of comparative data but in terms of the immediate next steps that we want to look at is sharing the experience from not just swift but george Elliott and y valley in, in terms of that sdec opportunity um and particularly reviewing some of hartmell's pdsa results the key areas we want to look at is particularly related to ED. So looking at that weighted activity units that um, was mentioned earlier in the fine chief finance officers a presentation on the urgent care pathway, looking at our cost per cubicle um, uh, uh, in, in ED um, and also the average uh, patient seen per hour per medic and also the percentage seen um, within the first hour. Some of those key initial first urgent care uh, productivity uh, uh, measures but as I said this is a starting point um, and the next step for us is finishing um, reviewing that data at a high level uh, via the, uh, the CUES group and then organising an urgent meeting with our operational management teams across our acute floors our GMs matrons and clinical leads to review that data and come up with the top two or three next steps to look at how we can um, uh, bring that shared learning and increase productivity um to the front the forum uh thank you very much no thank you andy and thank you uh philip and harkamel um really great learning coming out of that presentation i'll make a few points later but um other questions and perspectives glenn yeah that's a really helpful overview of just how complicated it is uh, so firstly well done to the, the coups and the operational teams for, for thinking on their feet and putting in lots of innovative solutions and, and, and managing through a difficult period. I think this highlights for me that productivity debate nationally and, and how we need to make it a bit more sophisticated because there's still nationally a conversation about number of a &E attendances, number of admissions and length of stay. Uh, and we all know that the shortest stay patients are the ones that we probably should never have admitted in the first place. And, and what the three of you have been able to do is build that SDEC capacity for a group of patients that we no longer admit, up to 40% uh, of, of those that would have previously been admitted and still are in other parts of the NHS, still are admitted, um, which is a result of, uh, as a result of which your, the length of stay for those you do admit will go up a bit. And that's 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 just an interesting factor that we need to. I think we are in a great position to get a bit more sophisticated about how you measure the true urgent care demand on the system and the solutions to it. The one thing I'd encourage you also to look at in next steps is just that the relative capacity that you've each built in your same day emergency care in your virtual wards uh, and just just check where you are with it, because I, I think that would Give us an idea about how much more capacity we might be able to achieve next year uh, and we certainly on a virtual ward perspective i think there's this huge potential for that to to grow a little bit more from where we are today but but you know that sharing between the three of you in, you know amongst friends i think is is the way that we're going to make ourselves even better in the future no very very pertinent points glenn any other questions or perspectives um uh, my observation would be I, I'm really delighted like I said in terms of the way you, you're learning recognizing when we've made mistakes you're agile you're thinking outside the box you're trying to find solutions your solution focused teams great the thing that is hampering you bluntly is agency because um, it, it we go back to this issue of the fact that, that we're seeping just in our foundation group 12 and a half million pounds of cash that could be available to you to really invest in some of these great schemes you've got available um, so i can't encourage you enough the issue of agency and rostering is at the root cause of our problems we do not have a problem in terms of the competence and capability of leadership we do not have a problem in terms of the ideas that we know we need to implement the only real problem we have is the agency usage that we are currently absorbing and that needs to be the challenge the combination the coups the cmos the cmds need to sort this year okay 
massive opportunity for all of you. And then we can reinvest that cash. OK, team, really good discussion. So we, like I said, had a discussion on levelling up uh, this morning with the Purpose Coalition, um, but we're just going to have a quick update now. So over to my Chief Strategy Officers. Thank you, Chair. So um, so I'll kick off and then I'll, I'll hand over to, to Jenny and Alan, respectively. Um, so as you say, we had we had a great discussion this morning with, with Alan and Mark, um, and we touched on some of the work that SWIFT had have done with the Purpose Co Coalition in terms of producing our, our impact report, um, which we did last year. Um, the, the two parts of, of the, the report that you've got there, I just wanted to, to pull out with some of the work that, that we're doing to sort of progress those levelling up opportunities, both across South Warwickshire Place and within the Trust. Um, so firstly, from, from a place perspective, um, we designed and developed with our place partner colleagues an intervention to support early assessment and clinical intervention for young people with um, mental health conditions that are experiencing health inequalities in, in our population. And really pleased to say we've um, recently received ICB funding to progress that as a pilot over the next couple of years. Um, and then within the trust, um, just to shine the spotlight a bit on some of the wonderful work that the um, Workforce Disability Network does in helping to provide innovative solutions for some of our disability challenges um, and also an internship that um, we're, we're launching across both SWIFT and George Elliott later on this year um, to, to provide supported work experience for young adults with learning disabilities in our local communities. Um, so those were the key points I, I wanted to, to pick out for SWIFT. OK, who's up next? It's me, Jenny. Unfortunately, my camera's not playing nicely today, so apologies that you can't see me, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, so in terms of um, George Elliott, um, we have, oh, we're in the process of doing the engagement for our um, levelling up, which has now concluded. Um, and what we've done is specifically worked really closely with um, our place colleagues to ensure that our levelling up report is um, uh, features sort of the, the work that's happening through through George Elliott as an anchor organisation, but also um, into place across the various different goals that are covered within the levelling up report. Um, particularly worked very closely with uh, with public health um, in that respect to link into some of the kind of key areas that came out of the JSNAs, etc. So our report, we have received it in draft. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't quite ready enough to um, sort of share as yet um, with this report, but we will have it for next time. But it's going to our um, place um, shortly um, and through our organisation. And the, the other thing to note is that we're also linking in with our boroughs because our boroughs, as you'll be um, aware, are really um, embracing the agenda around levelling up and they have also developed plans. And we're looking to ensure that um, of this report um, and the place focus um, aligns with their priorities as well so we can truly um, bring it all together and, and get that collaboration to support the levelling up agenda particularly around health inequalities in um, the um, Warwick North patch and with George Elliott's work. Thank you. Thank you Jenny and um, Alan. So from a wide value perspective we're uh, working with the Purpose Coalition at the moment to develop uh, uh, an impact report um, we've taken a an approach that we do this uh, with our one Herefordshire partners uh, and very much make it about our, our progress um, as, a, as a collective uh, uh, place and with the uh, evidence collection around that is ongoing at the moment so we're, we're underway with that. The second element I wanted to, want to talk about and put in here is around our work at place around the health inequality strategy. Uh, I chair that group. It's um, nearly complete. Um, we're just doing some engagement around that at the moment. Uh, but really good work. There's a lot of good work going around uh, health inequalities in Herefordshire. Uh, and, and some of the main recommendations that we put in here is around um, uh, improving people's digital uh, and health literacy so they can understand uh their their uh, uh their, their their issues understand their treatments and uh uh um work with uh professionals um uh to to uh, improve their, uh, their their condition um something about empowering our our staff to to understand the importance of health inequalities 
and to think about health inequalities in what they do and, and, and to start off by not making things worse. So uh, we, we've got, got, got a, uh, a whole plan around what we do around that. And then finally, it's actually about supporting communities to reduce inequalities within their within those communities, rather than um, coming together with a, a, a plan that um, uh, uh, the, or all of the organisations come together and create a plan to uh, reduce health inequalities ourselves. Very much want to support those communities to do what the, what they feel is important and to identify their priorities and work with them on. And one of the top two ways of doing that is through the primary care networks and the projects that they're all leading on uh, a place and uh, and also with our uh, community partnership uh, work with the voluntary sector uh, led by uh, Health Watch in Herefordshire that we're, we're uh, very much involved with. So a lot of really exciting work uh, uh, around that and that um, uh, strategy will be available shortly. Thank you, all three of you for your work. It's really important. Some things coming up in the chat boxes you might want to have a look at. We do have buses in Warwickshire. You'll be pleased to know, David, uh, but the bus service is a challenge in Warwickshire, as I know it is in Herefordshire. Um, other questions or perspectives on the levelling up work? Um, members of the public won't have been at our um, presentation this morning, but we have discussed it pretty comprehensively today. OK, so we'll move on then to the Foundation Group um, calendars for the rest of this uh, calendar um, fiscal year. Um, effectively, it's the first Wednesday in May, August, November and February. Um, deadline dates for papers um, are also provided in the pack. Any questions on the uh, cycle of Foundation Group three board meetings? Okie dokie. So I think we're then on to any other business. Um, Glenn, you were down for the one on productivity, but I think you picked that up early, didn't you? Any other, any other business? Please raise a digital hand. Okay, can't see any digital hands raised. So we're then on to questions from members of the public, um, including the Swift governors. Uh, we've had two questions that I'm aware of. Uh, Sarah Collette, do you want to read those out for me, please? Thanks, Russell. So, yeah, we've had two questions from Roger Lloyd, who is the Swift Public Governor for West Stratford and Borders. So the first question is the South Warwickshire Place Partnership Board is referred to in the levelling up report. Please explain the aims and objectives of this board and the extent of the engagement with it by South Warwickshire University NHS Foundation Trust. I think Anne Coyle is going to answer this question, Russell. Thank you, Sarah. So um, the membership of South Warwickshire Place Partnership Board was referred to in the earlier levelling up um, paper. In terms of South Warwickshire Trust involvement in it, uh, the co-chair of, 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 of the board is the managing director and also has involvement um, and membership from the uh, chief strategy officer. In terms of the aims and objectives of this board, um, it, actually the board has just refreshed um, its it, through the place partnership work that it's done uh, with the government association just recently reflected its um, aims and objectives. But it really takes its priorities uh, from um, the, the a number of um, publicly available um, uh, papers, the Workshop Health and Wellbeing, uh, board uh, strategy, the joint strategic needs assessment, and more recently, uh, the Coventry and Warwickshire integrated care strategy. In terms of the work of the South Warwickshire Place Partnership Board, we've just undertaken a, an end of year, an end of 2022 reflection and look back on the achievements. And I can, and I've, I've just um, circulated um, that to, to Roger. Thank you. Well, I think it is fair to say, and isn't it, that um, you're very conscious, we're very conscious, that so we need to make sure with all these various different uh, pieces of work going on in the system that there's not overlap. So I know a lot of work has gone on to try and minimise the overlap. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, 
Oh gosh, absolutely. Um, to try and keep you know the governance really there to enable enable the work and and indeed uh, quite recently there were two meetings. There was a meeting happening uh, that was led by the districts and and members and now we've amalgamated uh, the Healthy Citizens Forum um, into the Warwickshire Place Partnership Board. So that's absolutely something very much to the forefront and the governance is really there to support um, and to support and enable delivery for our residents. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne. And the second question, Sarah? Thanks, Russell. So given that the Foundation Group straddles two integrated care systems, can the Foundation Group fully achieve its potential whilst it's, it is operational across two systems? Glenn, are you going to answer this one? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Roger. Um, I, I think we're, part of the strength of the group is the fact that we we've got things in common and it, it doesn't matter which system we operate in those things uh, are broadly the same which is that the all three trusts want to be the lead provider to focus on the places in which they operate and to look at the, the growing needs of the population to look at prevention and integration uh, and so we get a, a huge amount of uh, ideas from each other uh, and also capacity to deliver against all of those things. And that's what we we walked through earlier when we looked at the strategy refresh and we'll be coming out when we launch this publicly soon. So I think that that that's that's a really strong thing. Uh, nationally, there's a recognition that groups can play a, a really key part in the delivery framework of the NHS by doing what we're doing. Uh, and so elsewhere in the NHS, there are other groups that span more than one integrated care system. Um, and so that isn't uh, slowing us down from making this progress. In fact, there are times where actually working in two systems does allow us to uh, report back to one or other system that the things that they said are not doable are actually doable because we're doing them in the other one. So, so I think that that compare and contrast how the two ICSs are approaching things has been helpful also. Um, I think ICSs themselves are, are starting to bed down in terms of their, their focus. Uh, and for me, their focus should be more on some of the big problems that the NHS and its partners face rather than some of the performance management stuff that that, that tier has tended to focus on in the past. So um, I can't say it wouldn't be easier if we were just in one integrated care system across the uh, entire group because it would be easier. But uh, I don't think it, it's a, a big inhibitor for us to be able to implement the strategies that, that we're keen to implement. No, thank you, Glenn. A great question, um, Roger. And um, we've got a few minutes. So, any other questions from members of the public? Uh, Mike Flaxman. Uh, thanks, Russell. Thanks. I, I just I'm, I'll start by saying how impressive this meeting is to me, and the efforts that are going in to improve things in our neck of the woods. From what I see in other parts of the country, we are doing very well. That's my view anyway. Um, I've got a quick question which to which there may not be an answer available at the moment. Um, in the use of resource opportunities, I noticed that uh, under Y Valley, they mentioned PFI handback as an opportunity to uh, do something in terms of saving. Um, I know the contract's got another six years to run, so I wonder what magic Katie had managed to uh, achieve in terms of seeing PFI handback now as an opportunity? Uh, that may be an unfair question to ask off the cuff like this. No, that, that's fine, Mike. Um, I'm just conscious of the fact this is a public meeting and uh, you'll understand um, the sensitivity of um, in a public forum saying stuff regarding a confidential contract. Um, so just before Katie comes in, I'd say we are in an interesting period in the runoff and to the end of the PFI, where we believe that there's a need for mutual recognition of how to make sure things are appropriately handled uh, by both parties. Um, there are some areas where we are um, in a level of discussion with our PFI partners, given works and expectations we have in terms of what they should be delivering. A very carefully worded that, Mike, as you can appreciate. Sure, um, yeah. if anything, I mean, Katie, if the answer is commercial and confidence, then yeah. I'm happy to withdraw it, Russell, actually. No, that's fine. Um, Katie, is there anything you'd like to add? 
Thank you, Chair. And it's a great question, Mike. And I guess it just is um, an opportunity to reflect that that slide of, of productivity and use of resources opportunities actually are things that are there from a medium term improvement perspective, not all of those would be for immediate oh. delivery in, in 23, 24. And, and, and so I think the answers that we've provided already around um, here by hand back probably describe that in that context of a more medium term eye on the future rather than an immediate 23, 24 opportunity. Yeah, I did um, raise the question as I, I gave David Moon some accounting advice on the PFI in 2005. So it, it rang a bell with me. So it's okay. quite interesting. Uh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm sure David Moon is smiling in the background at the recollection. Um, any other questions from uh, members of the public? OK, I can't see any other hands up and uh, so I will draw this meeting to a close. I'm really grateful to see so many of the public join us um, and again, just by way of closing, I can't thank our frontline teams enough for their phenomenal efforts over the last few months with all of the challenges of winter. Um, hopefully we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Um, this is a calendar year where we really do need to drive forward with momentum to fully maximise the potential of the foundation group. And I'm delighted and proud of the teams as to the level of recognition we're getting in terms of our endeavours. Um, to my three boards colleagues, can I suggest we have a 15 minute uh, stretch break? We get back together again at 3.30 for the confidential session. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.